Today, the airlines of the world pass through Germany. First stop, Hamburg, a city and a state. A center of finance, industry, and business, Hamburg is a hub of renewed German prosperity. With its toiling population of two million, it is also the second largest city in Germany after Berlin. Ulster Lake, with its business districts and splendid patrician homes, symbolizes the flourishing German economy. With Bremen, Hamburg shares the last privileges of the Hanseatic League. In the shelter of the river Elba's banks, the free port of Hamburg offers substantial advantages to European commerce. Close to 40 miles of wharves, 1,800 ships a month, and the largest shipyards in Germany. St. Pauli is the Pigalle of Hamburg, the favorite night amusement district of sailors and tourists. Also put under a taboo were these thieves and murderers who were buried 2,000 years ago. The peat bogs of Sleiblich have preserved their skin, their hair, and their clothes. These social outcasts lived at the time of the Vikings and the Romans. They say meeting a chimney sweep is a happy omen. So let us continue our journey through German past and present. A brief halt to pay our respects to the remains of the Neanderthal man, one of the Europeans distant ancestors. Then let us wander back into the mists of time to climb the Valhalla, a memorial to Germanic heroes erected on the Danube. From Frederick I to Karl Marx by way of Bach, Goethe and Wagner, all the celebrities of German history are here. At every epoch, German history was closely linked to nature. Upstream from Koblenz, where the river Rhine narrows, in olden times a blonde sorceress bewitched the boatmen and led them to their destruction on the rocks. The legendary Lorelei is still blonde today, but she's become a tourist on this tragic rock which bears her name. As for the Rhine, its fury has been quelled by man, and it has become the largest commercial waterway in Europe. It is in Bonn, also on the Rhine, that Ludwig von Beethoven was born in 1770. Since 1945, Bonn, the ancient Roman city of Verona, has become the capital of the Federal Republic. The Rhineland toll house of old now bristles with legislative assemblies, ministries, embassies, and chancelleries. It is at Bonn University, formerly the Palace of the Elector Princes, that Karl Marx and Wilhelm II received their schooling. With its Romanesque cathedral, its peaceful streets, and its flower-adorned squares, how could this village capital foresee its historic destiny?
The White House, German version. Hammerschmidt Villa is the Federal Republic's presidential residence. But one must travel eastward into the Brandenburg Plains to find a real capital city. Berlin has a real presidential palace, the castle of Bellevue, rather than a humble villa. Today, by jet, Berlin is less than an hour and a half from the other European capitals. Moreover, the safest and surest way of reaching it is by air, because since 1945, Berlin has been a divided city, a western enclave in eastern territory. In former times, Berlin, the capital of Prussia, made history like its rival Vienna. From Sanssouci to Charlottenburg, electors and kings erected a number of striking monuments. And Berlin was celebrated for the wit, humor, and gaiety of its inhabitants. A center of the arts, it accumulated inestimable treasures in its museums. And then, one day, like Babylon, Berlin stopped making history to become history. War turned Berlin, like Hiroshima, into a pile of rubble. Then, commemorated by the mutilated towers of Kaiser Wilhelm Church, came the amazing resurrection. In a few short years, thanks to a far-seeing reconstruction program, thanks to its two million inhabitants, new industries have turned West Berlin into a showcase. Medieval Germany is a land of beauty and of art, and many cities, towns, and villages have preserved intact the treasures of Germanic folklore, treasures which also recall the tormented times. Riemann Schneider, the Franconian sculptor, must have known the meaning of suffering to express divine mercy with such poignant beauty. From Würzburg to Nuremberg, a romantic itinerary gives the modern traveler a taste of picturesque Germany. Age-old houses, marketplaces, gothic bridges, tortuous old streets. Despite feudal wars and religious strife, the charm of the German countryside has remained. For in those uncertain times, as today on this fountain of Nuremberg, one often had to turn the ring of luck to secure one's future. Martin Luther, whose reformed worship spread thanks to Gutenberg's Bibles, divided Christianity by advocating strict religious discipline. And many a heretic finished his life suspended in an iron cage from a church spire, like that of Munster Cathedral. Dishonest merchants and tongue waggers were condemned to wear the iron mask. Or sit on the penitent's chair. 
But persecution could not quell the good spirits of the people during the days of princely opulence. In the little Bavarian village of Lanshut, they still evoked the sumptuous wedding of Louis of Bavaria's son with the King of Poland's daughter. At each ceremony, the people of Lanshut are there by the thousands, applauding their noble ancestors in the person of the notary's daughter, the baker's son, or the true descendant of the Margrave of Baden. At Rothenburg, another historical highlight remains in the mind of every citizen. Every day, the clock on the city hall recounts to tourists how the vanquished city was pardoned by Tilly, the chief of the Catholic armies during the Thirty Years' War. If there is one of you, said he, who can drain this cup in a single draft, I shall spare the city. Up stepped the devoted burgomaster. He seized the seven-quart cup and drank it down at a gulp and Rothenburg was saved from disaster. Another critical period is evoked in this shepherd's dance commemorating the end of the plague conquered by the prayers of the peasants. In a long wave of destruction, the Thirty Years' War swept over the Protestant cities, cracking through their walls and battlements. The soldiers terrorized the people who suffered unspeakable misery and hardships. One by one, the Protestant strongholds surrendered to the armies of the Catholic League. The city of Dinkelsbühl finally surrendered to its Swedish conquerors, who were infuriated by the stiff resistance put up by its inhabitants. Like an angel's battalion, all the children of the conquered city came to beg the conquering colonel for mercy. The colonel took pity on the children, and the city was spared. Since that day, Dinkelsbühl has the youngest regiment in the world, with an eight-year-old colonel, wooden rifles, and its own band. Like the history of Europe, the history of Germany is in tune with modern progress, development of industry and commerce. Once again, Germany has become a giant of industry. The huge symbols of its economic prosperity are everywhere to be seen. This is the Germany of tycoons and businessmen.
Krupp, one of the princes of the Holy German Industrial Empire, chose Essen as his capital and took up residence in the famous Hügel Mansion. In the Ruhr, where the flowers wither and die, Thor, the German god of thunder, has regained his ancestral power. Here, iron and steel are born. Here, guided by the hand of man, fire gives life to inert matter. And here is the Bible of the consumer's paradise, 1,500 pages and weighing over two pounds, the catalog of the Hanover Fair. Every year, the fair lasts 10 days. It has 5,000 exhibitors and receives millions of visitors. For businessmen who are in a hurry, there is a direct airline to every large German city. The Hanover Fair is the world rendezvous of consumer goods, the Disneyland of buyers. Driven on by curiosity, carried away by desire, they inevitably end up by buying. The road to progress now takes us to Bavaria, at the foot of the Alps, where science has just erected a new temple, the nuclear reactor of Munich University. Unchanged since the time of Wilhelm I, Bavaria remains the most characteristic of the German states, and one entirely turned towards tourists. Situated at the end of the Alpine range, Munich, the city of monks and the capital of Bavaria, boasts eight centuries of history and a million inhabitants. Every day on the Marienplatz, to the sound of the 11 o'clock chimes, the notables go through the same ceremony they initiated centuries ago when the great plague finally receded. Enriched by the salt trade and open to all cultural influences, Munich has also become an art center. Here all styles mixed in happy harmony and Baroque art burst forth in striking and lavish fashion. An architect king, a patron of the arts rather than a politician, Ludwig II's dreams of grandeur were limited to building magnificent castles. After the exotic splendor of the Orient, Wagner and German mythology inspired him to build Neuschwanstein. Then came the Grand Century, during which Ludwig II played at being a second sun king and built Heeren Kimse. But alas, this imitation of Versailles was the beginning of the end for the mad and penniless monarch.
Thousands of visitors come to Munich each year, for the city has preserved the carefree and happy hospitality found in the Mediterranean regions. Its situation, climate, and love of leisure have made it the artist and tourist center of Bavaria. But Munich is also the Oktoberfest. Now 150 years old, the famous celebration still attracts thousands of visitors from Germany and all over the world. In Teresa Park, under the benevolent gaze of the goddess Bavaria, the October festival lasts 15 days and 15 nights. No one in Germany would want to miss the fun during which tons of famous Munich specialties are consumed. Of course, the best thing to wash down all these delicacies is beer, and there's plenty of beer to go around, an average of two quarts per visitor. More than three million quarts are dispensed during the festivities to the thirsty guests of Munich. And there's an unforgettable atmosphere in all the famous beer houses. We end our brief journey with these scenes. But to know it better, you should visit Germany and see it for yourself. And when you go, go by Air France Jet.